please welcome the uh, founder and the, for two days now, former uh, uh, chair of the board, uh, Kiersi Piha. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's a good question, as I said, you know, because to be honest, you know, we just, you know, kind of create things as we go along. So <laughs> let's, let's figure it out together what is change consultancy. Um, it's very nice and exciting actually to be here. I've like 150 years ago studied in Helsinki School of Economics, which was then at Runeberinkatu, and you know this looks really awesome compared to that. <laughs> so change is good, as as we say. Okay, so I don't know how much you you know like to discuss about things, so how much you want me to uh, you know present things or anything. So if you have anything to to ask if you have anything yeah, that you ha uh, want to challenge wi wi uh, me with or conflict me or anything, then please, you know, just uh, just do so, so that it doesn't become a boring lecture because that's that's maybe not something that either of us really likes to do. So I think that today I'm going to a bit um, maybe talk about purpose because um, we believe very strongly that if you have a purpose as a company, then you know the, the doing is so much easier because you have some, some sort of backbone uh, to, to the thing that why you do things and how you do things. Then I'm talking a little bit about present, so our clientele and what we do, and, and I do not, uh, in, in the present section, you know, I talk more about communications and in the future section more about the change consultancy. And you can see the actually quite logical change that we have made. It's not so some kind of jump from this to that. It's very logical. So, um, especially in English, the name is always a question. So, what the hell is Elun Kanat? is the thing that, uh, that you know, people ask. And you know, it, it turns out that explaining that is actually pretty hard. So uh, the first thing I think, you know, because uh, Ville asked you that how many of you know Ellun Kanat and uh, in Finland we are actually the most uh, uh, known uh, consultant, uh, uh, communications agency. So why are we that? And I think that part of it is the name. It Actually, a big part of it is the name, not the work we do, which would be fu uh, really, really fun as well. But you know, the thing is that when you build a company, when you start a company, how many of you actually are, have started a company or want to start a company in the future? Okay, great. So I recommend it, by the way. <laughs> it's, uh, it's actually, I think, um, well, I became entrepreneur quite like accidentally. And if you, you know, if you are in, uh, in your 40s, it's a good age to build a company. I was in my 40s, so you don't have to do it straight out of school, you can do it later. But it kind of was, you know, accident. I first, I um, kind of worked from my kitchen, like two years or something. Len then I got bored, you know, being alone in my kitchen and doing the work, so I actually hired the first employee and her job was to find an office space. And then she found an office space and then we were, you know, a real company because we had offices. And then, you know, kind of from there it, it just, you know, grew and grew and now we have like almost 70 people working for us. We have to switch our office spaces like for to two to three years because we, we get cramped in the small offices and so on. Now we have in Kankuja, we have a really big office so that we think that we maybe can be there like five years, even ten. We are now like 66 employees and we are thinking that we are in, in a few, ways, few years we are a hundred uh, employee company. So the name. Uh, so when I started the company there were these communications gurus and, and these business gurus in Finland who said that well the first thing Kirsi if you want to be a respectable company you have to change the name. You cannot be Elun Kanat because you know you, you need the clients' respect, you need the big companies, and, and they do not want to buy from Elun Kanat. I was like, well, I'm kind of attached to that name, you know, and I, I really like it because there's a story to it. And my advice to you, if you haven't already started your company, start with the name and be bold. Because if you want to be recognized, you know, if you want your potential clients to notice you, 
you have to have something special. And if you are a minuscule little, little company and you have one employee, you know, you need to have some communications muscles and the name is one of that. So, why are we Elon Kanat and what about the chickens and the eggs? As I said, we are not after the respectability. We, we seek to impact and the name is one part of this. Okay, you wanted to have a picture of it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, picture moment. <laughs> Great. So this is a long story about the name, but some of you know that it's actually, it comes from a Finnish proverb, and that comes from the Finnish uh, book, The Unknown Soldier. And it's like the proverb says that, you know, mm, um, we do uh, professionally what we do, and then we, you know, play hard or something like that. It's really, really hard to translate. If you Google translate it, you get it like Ellu is a, is a person, it's a she, and then she has chickens, but that's not really what the name means. Nevertheless, I mean, the name is good. We, we always say that we don't, we don't want our clients to, you know, do lukewarm communications, so we have to be bold ourselves. And, you know, the name has stuck. And there actually was, like maybe seven years ago, there was this big moment where we thought that maybe, you know, if we really want the big clients, if we really want the big international companies, we have to actually change the name. And we had already the other name. It was, I, if I remember rightly, it was 80 slash 20 communications or something like that. You know that you need to do the 20% to get the 80% impact and so on. It's like Elon Kanat sort of, but in the numerical way. So, um, so then we, we sat there in the sofa in our offices, all of us, and we it was a grim moment, you know, we were, should we do this or not? And then I asked a question from my employees. I asked that, in which company would you like to work? And they all said, well, we, d we would like to work in Elon Kanat. We prefer Elon Kanat. And then I, I thought that, okay, we are Elon Kanat because that's our philosophy. We start with good work. We also sponsor Petra Olli. I don't know if any one of you knows. It's a star Finnish woman wrestler. Um, we have been hoping for her to win the Olympic gold in Tokyo this year. She has been having some injuries, so it's really exciting and, and actually, her manager asked us uh, that, is it troublesome for us, you know, as a sponsor, if she doesn't get to Tokyo at all? And we said, no, because, you know, the, the, uh, the business, the work is always hard. You cannot, you know, speculate with everything. You cannot guarantee everything. The, the thing is that Petra is a really, really gutsy uh, athlete, a really, really uh, work hard kind of attitude person, and that suits us. She says here, um, there are probably some who don't fi speak Finnish, so she says something like, you know, uh, the, the important thing is that you don't do the same thing as the other do, the same, same thing as your competitors do. You do something different and you bring something new into the game that, and if you succeed, it's something that the other ones, the compet competitors want to then imitate and copy, and that's like the success. And I think that we have, you know, some, somehow we have succeeded. So the first thing, if you are starting a company, I think, is that if you build something new, why do it in the old-fashioned way? But the pressure, as I said, with the name and all, it's really, really hard. It's really strong because, you know, they, uh, people say that, no, if, if you have like 50 employees, you have to have the hierarchy, you have to have, you know, titles, you have to have this, you have to have career paths and everything and that. And yes, it's true. If you don't have those, you have uh, some kind of friction in, inside the company as well. But you have to be true to your values and, to, and, and your own ideology. And I think that, you know, if we always build the companies the same way that, you know, it has been built in, Ten years, uh, in 10 years or 20 years past, so then we get, you know, the same companies. If we want something new, we have to be bold and we have to, be have, be we have, to have muscles to build something differently. And it is hard. So where did it all begin? I already said that I was working in my kitchen, but uh, maybe the no asshole rule started even before, even before I was an entrepreneur, even, if, even before I even knew that I would become one. 
Uh, some of you know that uh, that my background is in politics. I was like a little bit, uh, maybe 10 years, 11, 12 years. I was member of the uh, Finnish parliament and member of the European parliament. And when I then decided to, you know, go, uh, you know, start something else than the politics, I had one rule and I thought that, well, I'm not going to work with assholes anymore. <laughs> And I'm sorry, I'm sorry to everyone who works in politics, but you know, it's like the backstabbing culture that's not really inspiring. And I thought that if I'm going to do something, I'm going to be sure that the people I work with, I like them and I'm, I'm not turning into an asshole as well, because that's a problem, of course. So, we started with the no asshole rule. Then, as I said, we have, we have sort of an ideology that we believe that good companies work, and at least for us it has worked well. We start with good work, and that, by the way, doesn't mean that it's easy or fun or, you know, something like that. It can be that, but mostly it means that it's challenging. It's, uh, it's work for people who want to challenge themselves. It has to bring you meaning, it has, has to bring you, you know, some kind of capabilities that you can develop. It, it has to bring you some sort of career path, but not maybe the traditional one. Maybe, you know, some kind of learning career path, uh, rather than, you know, uh, something that builds from status to status. And, and then, of course, it means... Uh, yes? That's a good question. Okay. Because I, I can answer it later on, but I can now also already answer it. We don't, um, we don't like to say that we select our clients because, you know, that would sound a bit, you know, snobbish. And, and, but we do have conversations with some um, industries. If, if some client wants to be, some potential client wants to be our client, then we have the conversation that is this industry something that we want to work with? Uh, then we, uh, then w we analyze the company. What is their goal? If it's a company in a bad industry that wants to change it and or wants, wants to change its own behavior or, or own strategy, why not? We are a change consulting company. I was wondering that if somebody wants to move white, wants to move green, wants to move that kind of That's hard on us. Yeah. yeah. We, uh, we have always kind of thought, you know, because the communications is not communications only. It's like the deeds you do. It's the things you do and then you, communi you communicate them. It's, the, it's a package. So you cannot do something and then communicate something else. Or Well, you can, but, but I don't think that we are a good partner then. <laughs> You're an asshole. <laughs> um, I know. There are cases where the customer thinks the Ellen Kanat rule actually the you know um asialliset hommat hoidetaan muuten ollaan kuin Ellen Kanat the proverb actually means that you know you do the you do the diligent work you do you do you do you do work hard for the for the customer. But it's not, you know, something that gives the customer the right to kind of uh, what's pompotta, you know, to, yeah. So there have been a few cases like that. And, and then we have, vi we have been having the discussion with the client, you know, that, you know, we're, we're, we're not really, you know, the kind of agency that you can, you know, do that with. And, and, and we want that our people have good work and it's a big, big thing for us. So if we want to, you know, continue our working relationship, we have to, you know, think about the rules again. Uh, not many times, because, you know, it's also something that it's, it's professionalism also to uh, manage the situation so that it doesn't come to that. But uh, a few cases, yes. And, and I, I remember at least one case that we dropped the client. But I think it was good for both of us, you know, <laughs> because it's also, you know, this is so, um, it's kind of an intimate relationship with the client. So if, if the chemistry doesn't really work, then, you know, the work doesn't really work either. So, yeah, but it's a hard one. It's also a hard one when you have the asshole in the company because you can recruit an asshole. And, and then, you know, if you have one asshole, then, you know, the whole atmosphere can be ruined. 
and it's really, really hard because the asshole doesn't really, you know, see himself or herself as an asshole. If I'm an asshole, I probably don't see it myself. Someone has to be telling me, you're an asshole. And that's something that we have. We have a really strong conflict culture, if you can say that. We, we, we don't... Um, we like conflicts, if you can say that. We, we like that, you know, you don't stab the person, you know, from the back, but you come straight forward they tell tell that you know now you're being asshole or or you know you shouldn't do that or why do you do this usually you know actually the why question is enough because then you can see that okay, okay well she or he has some kind of logic why she or he behaves like that and it can be corrected then <laughs> have you seen it lately have you you know <laughs> yeah, um, there's nothing wrong with politics. I mean, the mission is really good. And I, I think that it's one of the most meaningful work that you can have, actually, because you represent people. It's really, um, I found it really rewarding as well. But the working environment is not rewarding and it's not inspiring. It's not, you know, I, I'm, I'm so happy. I just, you know, a few nights ago, I said to my husband that I'm so happy that I, you know, got the, you know, really, uh, the nerves and and the the boldness to also you know step down because it's not so easy you can you, you can speculate that well you know i could be elected again and four years and do this and do that and in that time when i was in politics there still was some kind of you know people still valued <laughs> the people who worked there more but but i'm really happy because i think that um, working in the business environment, yeah, there can be politics, and that's par part of the no asshole rule, no p no office politics, you know. Uh, and I'm really, really, you know, sensible uh, or or um, what do you call herka for that. I'm I'm really, you know, if I sniff some office policy politics, I'm I'm really, you know, no, this is not how we do things. But but yeah, I think the wor the the people you work with and the environment is really important for for the work uh, if uh, even to the meaning of the work because I think part of the meaning or even you know a big part of the meaning is the people you work with and that's funny actually because two days ago uh, the news came that, uh, about our changes but uh, I told to our people around like three weeks or four weeks ago about the changes and it was a big thing actually because you know I founded the company and I own most of it and I'm you know chairman of the board and I'm not the chairman of the board who comes only to the meetings but I'm really really you know in there and and uh, you know they say that when you give up something it's painful and it really is painful but it's even concretely pa painful because the next night I got ill and I've been in flu, you know, I'm fluish and feverish right now. I've been since then. So, I mean, I think it's kind of, you know, funny that it happened exactly then. So, yeah. So, and I think that a big part of that is that I'm also, you know, giving up uh, those people that I work with. Not completely, but the role is really different. So I have to find meaning. <laughs> Today is still 90, <laughs> but uh, in the coming uh, months uh, I will be owning 51%. So that's an indica indication I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> okay. It's fine. Well, everybody is an asshole at some, at some point, you know, that's, that's just the reality. Uh, the biggest and, and most important advice is that work in a company that has open communications. The culture that, that you know, really uh, values open communications, values challenging, uh, and, and you have to be yourself, you know, someone who values that if people conflict your views or something that you have to, you know, you cannot say that, no, we do it this way. And, and that doesn't mean, you know, that you have to discuss like forever about things, but uh, the open and, and kind of honest communications culture, I think, is the best advice because that keeps us, you know, from becoming the asshole. And when we, you know, are going to that direction, then, you know, someone can stop us.
Okay, can we move on? Anything else? So the good work part is really important for us. Uh, it's something like it's trendy now to say that you're uh, a customer-centric company or your employee-centric company. We are not either, we are both. But the thing is that it starts from the good work. So because we believe that when you do, when you have good work, you have people who feel that the work is good and challenging and, and they have fun also, then you have happy customers because we are in, in you know, pretty much uh, in, in human business. So, so the thing is that our consultants are working with people who, who need solutions to their problems. So you have to, you know, be, you have to feel good in your work and in your skin in order to help. And then when you have happy com cu customers, you also have useful business. And you, when I say useful, I mean it in two ways. I mean it uh, in, the, um, in the, you know, maybe original way that, you know, you, you make profit. It's a useful business. But it's also useful only if you bring something to the customer's table. So that's the, the reason why we challenge ourselves. That's the reason why we are talking about change consulting and not only communications agency kind of stuff and so on. Why we think that communications is, is something more than just, you know, some PR or something like that. Which is actually funny because when you go internationally, we have been struggling to find partners globally because, you know, communications agencies are not good partners for us because they are very, very strictly PR oriented companies and that's not who we are. So we have to already, you know, partner in, in from uh, different uh, industries or different uh, those. We have partnered, for instance, in the with the innovation company from New, New York, the Future Think, which is not communications at all, but is something that we feel that is, is necessary in our, in our work and is, is a valuable, valuable partner. So this is what we believe in and why we do things the way we do. And then there is another way which you can see or, or you know, uh, maybe, analyze a company and I think that the companies uh, at best three things it's of course business so it's it's a useful business then it's community and th by the community I don't mean only the good work and the inner community I mean that if you want to have an impact in this world if you want to have long relations with your clients you have to build a, a community that is outside of yourself with your clients but with the world as well you know we have made ourselves uh, known by communications because we we really believe it is the tool for for that so it's the tool also to build a community and then the company can at best be a platform. It can be a platform to something that we want to do as a company if we want to change the world to something, if we have a purpose that is bigger than just being a business. But it can also be, and, and at best is, a platform for people who work there. So if you are ambitious, you know, uh, art director, what can you do? What is the platform that we give to you so that you can have wings? And we have actually have quite few people who have been working with us and then started their own companies. And I just said to Taru, our CEO, yesterday that, hmm, we are a business incub incubator. Is it good or bad? <laughs> and, and one of our ex-employee, -em Merja Mähkä, I don't know, you maybe have heard of her, said to me that it's so funny because, you know, the work in Elunkanat is so whole. You have to do the whole thing, you know, with the client. So then pretty quickly you learn it and you can, you know, start your own company. And she was like, you know, I'm sorry about that. And I said, no, I think it's fine. I think it's fun. It's good. It's, I think the best thing that can be is that we have people who have worked for us and they say that you gave us the wings. I think that's a valuable, also a purpose kind of thing. And the platform is for that. And then there is the ideology. Many people think that businesses shouldn't have ideologies, you know, that they should, you know, be like uh, neutral, if you can say that. We have, we have ideology and we have a strong stand. Uh, we say that communication is the power tool for change and it means that we have challenged our industry from the beginning, actually. And we could even reward it for that, that we have challenged the industry to become better and, and to serve clients better. So, so that's, that's the thing that we kind of keep in our core, that we think that communication is more than just communication. 
So, and our strategy is based on, on ongoing conversation. It's not something that we do, you know, the board does the strategy and then, you know, you bring it to the employees to execute. It's not like that. We have ongoing conversations with, uh, three, uh, with four things all the time. And that means that we have dialogue all the time. We streamline our, our strategy all the time. It's not something that maybe if, you know, I came here like month, month from now, I could maybe, you know, something could have been changed already. Not likely because we have been doing this for two years, but anyway, within the two years, it has been changing a lot. So we have the conversation with the world, conversation with the future, with the present, and then with the culture. And let's start with the culture. Because the good work is our main thing that where, where we, you know, kind of go on, then the culture, of course, is very important. I just highlight three things. We have very um, non-hierarchical -hierar way of, of doing work, uh, but I'm not getting into that. I'm just uh, taking three things that I think that are important in when we, when we take uh, the stand to the change consultancy. This is in Finnish, sorry about that, but it's something that we had our strategy day and then there was a person who then make made a picture of it and it's kind of, you know, at least it shows, even if you don't speak a language, it shows that there's a lot going on <laughs> kind of thing and there is a lot going on in our business. One thing I want to highlight there is this person who says, I need help, I need help. Uh, we are in a business that is really hectic and it means that people can have too much work. People can, can have occasionally too much work. Then when you're a really good employee, you know, you tend to have a lot of work. So it happens that, you know, when you, y if you, you know, hoard the work by yourself, you know, then you get burned out. And we have a culture that if you feel at all like that, you have to, you know, raise your hand and you get help. And we are really quick to help then. But because we don't have the bosses, so then we need the people to be themselves really proactive about this. So three things. One is that we are intensive partnerships. I, I really didn't, you know, uh, get the English uh, version of the term taistelupari, but that's the thing that we call that we are taistelupari uh, to ourselves, to our colleagues and also to our clients. We are sometimes uh, so intense partners to, uh, towards our clients that some people do not like it because we do challenge there's a conflict thing that's, that's coming on. We do challenge the way of doing things. And, and there is uh, not one or two or three competitions that we have lost because the potential client has said that they don't want to be challenged this much. And then, you know, our, our people say that, oh, we lost to Milton again, god damn it, and so on. And I said that, you know, it's good because if we see why we lost, we have actually succeeded in something because A, they know who we are, they know what we do, and B, the, the work that we did for the competition represents that. So we have to be happy, even though, you know, for the useful business way, we are actually not. But if we think about the future, we really are. The second one, and that's maybe one of the most important, is curiosity. It's, it's a mindset. Uh, we are uh, right now working with Mika Sutinen, the new, uh, new chairman of the board, uh, uh, with a book called uh, power of change in English so and, and, and there we are, um, you know, playing with the concept that how do you introduce this collective curiosity culture into the businesses. If you are in an in a environment that changes all the time, you, you need something else than just, you know, the bosses reading books with uh, among themselves. You need the whole organization to be curious to a whole lot of things, not just, you know, your work or your business or your industry or even your client. You need to know a whole lot of more. You need to be curious because I think that's the only thing that can actually conquer the fear of change if you are curious as a collective. So that's really important for us. And then there is the conflict thing. And this is something that when we uh, get new employees, they do kind of, you know, some of them do have problems with this. We are not all people who can conflict really easily. 
we can be timid, we can be very silent, and we can be, you know, not so forward going. And, and I know that there is struggle in, in some people, but I always say that, you know, the thing is because we promise to our clients that we challenge them. So we do have to kind of, you know, find within us the, the place where we can do that safely and securely. Because many times with, with, a with a client, it's not so safe and secure. It's really scary sometimes. So you have to kind of, you know, build your conflict muscles. And we do that then inter internally. And we, uh, we're not, you know, the best of it uh, in, in this regard. We have to uh, always, you know, see the asshole things, that we are not becoming assholes who just conflict for, for fun, you know, because that's not really constructive. And we have to, you know, systematically think that if you are the timid one, so how do we make sure that if you have something to say because you do, then how, do, how can you, you know, express yourself in this environment wi when we all are really, you know, pushing and so on. And, and that's something that we work all the time uh, and, and hopefully we are becoming all, all the time better and better. But it's, it's an important value for us. And yes, Ellu still has this no asshole rule and it's a strict one. Um, we don't want the culture where people are gathering, you know, smoking cigars and talking about you, for instance, because it's not the way we do things. And as I said, there have been some in incidences like that, but not, not now. Now we have really, really good kind of atmosphere and I'm, I'm really happy about that. And then, you know, because everyone knows that it's, this is a strict rule, then it kind of, you know, it, it builds in the culture, which is good. So then, a uh, short conversation with the present. Uh, our employees are pretty happy, and it's a good thing. We, we work, of course, always to be better, but it's pretty good. And our customers are also pretty happy, because I think we have the good work in place. And if the customers are happy, then, you know, they say it and we are really uh, honored because we get really good reviews. Um, if we see, th these are just from our own survey uh, and our own customers, not the potential customers, but the ones who know us. And you don't need to read it. It's like, you know, well, I'm finished, you know, it's kind of you know, embarrassing, but it's really good. They like us and that's, that's really important. The one thing we do need to and, and do want to ask, of course, is that if we are heading to something else, to something new, how are our uh, present com uh, clients seeing us? You know, Do they see us solely as a communications agency or something else? And we have, oh, every year it's a bit more. So we did, like two years ago, we asked the potential clients and clients that what uh, if they think of us, what's the one thing that comes to mind and it was change. So it's, it was the thing that, you know, when you come, we know that something is changing. You push it, so it changes. And so that's, th that's the base of our strategy, of course. The change couldn't have been bigger. And as I said, we do not work solely with the communications. We work with the company culture. And this is uh, one of our, those clients. And when the customers are happy, then we get good reviews from the industry, which is good. And now we are not anymore part of the MTL Finnish uh, uh, organization, but we hope that our reputation still is intact. Oh, but, but I think that uh, maybe the industry just... Um, we grew out of the sole industry of communications. And then if everything else is good, then the also the business is good. And we have grown fast but steadily. We have also made some profit, which is good because it gives us muscle for the future. And we have also plenty much uh, employees than then 2008 when I started the company. Then the conversation with the world, which is actually something that we do for our clients very often. We do this kind of scenario work. Uh, what does the world look like? What does your industry look like? What does your clients? What do the, your clients look like, and so on? And we are very future-based. We have very future-based uh, way of seeing things. And in English, you can maybe say that we shake, rattle, and roll. We we blaze new trails. 
we really do we enjoy the disru disruption i call it double disruption i will explain it later what i mean with it but uh, the mission is you know not to be afraid of the turbulence but kind of you know enjoying the ride it's not always easy but you know if you have your partner it's it's easier our purpose is that we are strong force for change that's our main thing we bring conversation and communication to make the change happen and we believe that change is good we believe actually change well you can say change is not neither good neither bad change is change and then you can make it you know for from your own point of view you can make it either good or then you know be just like a slave of it and we think that we can make it better if we if we push for for the for the change we are we have invested in pro bono work Ye the last year was our climate change year and we also became a vegetarian company how can a company be vegetarian well we just um, decided that everything that we serve in our company uh, venues is always going to be vegetarian and now we had just a few weeks ago we had this uh, uh with our uh, employees and I was just I was reserving the table we were like 10 or 12 people and then I thought that oh we have the vegetarian menu then oh, this is not our climate year this is 2020 then I no we're not going back you know we are the future based company we are the for the change so we have to enjoy it so we believe that all of us needs uh, needs to have balls we need the change we think that change is an attitude it's a necessity and it can also be an opportunity we have a strong voice and a vision it means that if we sell the communications muscles to our clients we do have to build them ourselves we are very we have strong presence in social media in various uh, channels we also publish a lot books uh, not only my <laughs> the books that I write, but we have this What Happens Tomorrow series. And uh, actually the next one is coming, I think, on March. And it's What's Happening Tomorrow for Reading. So it's not just our business-wise things, but it's something that happens in our world because we have to, we want to be, uh, you know, in on top of things, even. It's uh, What Happens Tomorrow for Reading. No, unfortunately. And there we come to this. Yeah, this is a work in progress. Elo is not speaking English yet, but it's something that we are working on for, for this year. So hopefully we have this um, report uh, for the future coming on 1st of um, April and that's in English, but yeah. Sorry? The customers that uh, we are sp speaking English with, was that the question? I don't see you. Can you raise your hand? Where are you? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> great. Yeah, wonder, like yes, we do. That's true, that's true. I would say that maybe, you know, like, um, well, this is on top of my head, but it's maybe 15% at least that that uh, the working uh, language is English. But our presence in social media, for instance, is, n is not in English and it's a sad story, but we are working on it. Then conversation with the future. This is like the boring stuff, so let's go really quickly. But when we um, made our strategy and built it l these last two years, we were uh, looking for two things especially we were looking at what is a consultancy market doing is it growing is it uh, where is it growing and so on and then what is our clients uh, needs and wants and not only today but in the future and then also that if they don't know what their wants and needs are today we have to be the ones who know what they need for tomorrow or from two years now so the consulting is growing business in Finland, the growth has been even bigger during the last few years than uh, maybe like eight to nine percent. If you look at the Europe strategy consulting market forecast, you can see that it's about you know ten percent yearly to 2025. So consulting business is doing great. Then there is um, the various services. Uh, 
that you can see strategy, transformation, uh, organizational strategies, everything, all of these are something that you need communication when you do these. Sorry. Uh, then you can see that the client's most pressing need in the future is actually to change 43% use consulting services in order to generate and execute change. So it's not just coincidence that we are going to go to that direction. Yeah, the fastest growing consulting businesses are specialists. Then they utilize new technology, which is something that we are very keen on, on developing. You know, what kind of muscles do we need there? Do we have to build them ourselves or do we have to, you know, get them in some other way? So because uh, building by yourself is not really very easy and we have tried that as well. Then you don't have batteries in this. <laughs> doesn't work okay well yeah so then we have this is our own uh, tool for for change we have analyzed a bit uh, um, the whole market not just the communications agencies and you can see that our analysis is that the tra traditional communications ad media agencies they lose their grip because you know the, uh, you have the traditional consulting houses that are attacking actually that business they are buying uh, uh, ad agencies, they are buying communications agencies, they are buying creative power sort of because they see that that's something that they need in the future. Then there are the tech companies you, who push from the other side with their database solutions that are also very, uh, uh, very important for the clients right now. So we think that the customer is somewhat overwhelmed and it happens, you know, so that when when they have a problem, they have something that they ha they need to change. They don't really know exactly, do we need ad agency? Do we need marketing? Do we need communications? Do we need strategy consulting? They pick something, you know, and then that becomes, m uh, you know, the lead agency if they are good. So we think that, and I know that this sounds too ambitious, but we think, because we are not Accenture or, or, or something like that, but we think that we have something that they need we have something that they need and we can build our own muscles from that because we are specialists who, who know something. And we think that there is a growing demand for these non-traditional companies in the strategy consulting business, in the change consulting business. And we think that we can very well be that. So then we thought that, okay, uh, there is a demand for that then, you know, who is there? Everyone is there. Because if you look at the web pages, everyone says that they are seeking change. They are doing the change for you. They are helping you to change, 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 change. So that's not kind of, you know, that's not a unique story to tell that you are a change agency. So uh, the to, to be or not to be question is actually not whether or not we are change a agency or consult uh, communications agency or whatever agency we are. The thing is that what kind of tool we have which is the most important when you need to change. And we have, of course, the answer for that. I like to say that um, actually there is no change without communication. There really is not. And, and we see that, and I'm saying that with uh, all kindness, uh, we see that uh, those big consulting, strategy consulting businesses, they come to the client, they give their PowerPoint presentation. That's what client says. We uh, wrote, wrote a book, What Happens Tomorrow to Consulting, uh, and did a, a little digging and, and maybe some spying. Uh, and, and the clients say, not our clients, but the clients of uh, the just clients for the strategy consulting business say that they get the PowerPoint presentation and then they are like overwhelmed that what what do we do now and Mika Sutinen says that uh, companies are filled with decisions that are not executed and what do we need we need communication because we do not uh, get the organization to execute anything if we don't have your com have the communication in the strategy core. It's not something that you do after that you have made, uh, done the strategy work. It's something that you have to do within the strategy work. 
Yes. We are very insightful. It means that's a nice way to say that we are very challenging. We uh, do um, a lot of publishing. We do a lot of research. We uh, really are keen on, on what happens in the future. Uh, someone uh, in our company, maybe it was even our CEO, said that, God damn it, all our time goes to researching the future. But, you know, it's an important thing in, in this one. And we say the double disruption means kind of like this. We see that we have, on the other side, we have the communication revolution, which is this. You're doing it now. <laughs> yeah. So you, we are sharing the content uh, in in light speed, we are creating the stories ourselves, and and so actually the communication revolution didn't start from the internet. It started with the mobile, because then we started to generate the stories. We started to have a real impact because we could globally, you know, have a conversation about me to about anything we want. We globally know ex precise the sec next second what has happened all over the world. It's a real revolution and it's something that when talking about politics, I think that poli politicians were really good at it in the beginning because, you know, the companies have not used to talk to people. They have used to talk to PR people who then talk to people and that's a big cultural change actually. But the politicians have always, you know, they have to talk straight to the people. Because the media always, you know, presents them wrong or something like that. So they have these tupaillat and they go to the valimekki and so on. And they have the conversation straight with people. Yeah. I think it's, um, it's a little bit different if you just communicate or when you put systematically, systematically a culture that's open communication. Or if you systematically think how you, how you do your strategy with the people that, that are working in your company. Or you do it in the board and then you give it to the people. It's a communication culture. It's not something that we are talking. It's, it's not enough that we are talking with each other over coffee. It's something that you systematically build within the company. That's one part of it, an important one. If you could, if, if, you, if I could say what my dream is, it would be something, and it's not going to happen, and I'm not going to have the brains to do it, but it would be that, that the company would have a big communal brain. That sounds... I, th I think it sounds stupid, I know it, but it's my dream, you know, that the communication would be so systematic and so ingrained in the DNA of the company that we would have, you know, like a collective brain. Maybe someday we do. <laughs> but we have this communication revolution and then we have a really strong push with the climate change. And then there's something else that we have actually put there ourselves. Uh, it's the human capacity. And I think that it's even, you know, as important as the, as the climate change problem. Because we see uh, depression, we see burnout, we see 30-year peop year old people who, who, you know, don't, don't, can't work anymore. We have a really big problem there. And it's something that is, it's not a company's problem. It's something uh, that we culturally have generated. So we have to also together kind of solve it. So I think these two things are, and the company is in the middle of this kind of double disruption. So double disruption, du uh, double disruption as we call DD, then in this double disruption kind of a, a place, you need four things you need to have as a company, purpose and identity. You need to have this organizational change, what kind of cult company culture you have, what is the kind of company culture that generates change. Uh, you have to have brand and communication, which is not just something that you state, but something that you, you know, talk with people. And then you have the dialogue with the world. You, you 
you actually people do want companies nowadays to be activists. They, they want them to have impact. They want them to be for something and not just for their business, but for something for the whole community. And of course, we think that communication is the power tool here. In every four step, you need the communication. Without it, you don't have it. Not yet. I would say not yet. It's coming. Yeah. I think it's 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 definitely coming. I think Neste has has made a good work. I think that's that's something. It's not just you know some statement. It's something that they actually do. Yes. Yes. And then you have built your business also for the future, which is which is good. Then there are ve many ongoing processes, I think, in Finnish companies. Finnish companies are really good because they are very uh, respectful and they, are, they really do things good. You know, they are uh, responsible companies, as, t uh, as, as you can say. But they are a bit timid, you know, to have a purpose. And then they think, you know, that the uh, shareholders, you know, you have to remember the shareholder value and something. And that's something, that's a, sh the, uh, a shift, you know, that we have to make. That it's not just the shareholder value, but it's something bigger. And then you can also create the shareholder value better. But it's, it's something that is just happening, I think, in Finland. And I think that the smaller companies actually have, you know, done this before. They have, they have done this, like, in within the few, few years now. And they are starting to benefit from it, which is good to see. Koti Pizza is, I think, a good example of a purpose kind of company. And also uh, of a culture that is built around that purpose. Okay. Shit. Then when I push it, you know, three times, then it goes like this. Okay, well, this is the last one. So, uh, you, uh, Ville was mentioning this article that we have... Um, just announced our change and I hope that something that I now told you uh, kind of you know opened what it is or or you know explained what it is that we mean when when we do that as I said it's a big change for me but it's not so big because I think that you know we have been a duo and now we are a trio and and I think that uh, super cells Ilka mm, uh, Panonen said today that diversity is really uh, important issue and it's in, in within us as well. We have very very different people from very different backgrounds uh, within our company, but we have had just two, you know, leaders and they are both female. So now we have the <laughs> male energy. So we think that that's also a good uh, also a good thing for the business. Yeah. So this is it. Yeah, it's actually good that you mentioned that because it's something that when we have new employees, um, they always question this policy because they say, no, we cannot tell three weeks ahead. I mean, you know, it, they will tell and, and then we don't have the news. And we just always say that, no, it's, it's not our culture. We can trust our people. When we, when we know something, we tell them. And that's actually part of the no, no asshole thing that you have the open you know, communication and it's, it's, you know, you have to do it yourself. <laughs> you don't have the culture if you don't do it yourself. And, and we have never, ever had any problem with that. Never. Yeah, uh, I can jump in here. If you are done with your presentation, yeah. then we can hop on in the Q&A and we can actually go around with the mic. Okay, great. So. Uh, can we have a can round of applause? This? Yes, this it's for me. you. Great. Yeah. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand and I'll pass you a mi microphone so we can get it also on the vi video. Thank you. So. Okay. So um, thank you. Um, and my question is on, on you say that you're going to be a um, change agent, but you also have your own company most likely going through a major change. How are you going to do that? Very good question. We eat our own dog food, as they say. Uh, we have been doing that change for two years, 
it just hasn't been you know public or something like that so i think that we have built strong muscles for it mm, there's still people uh you know within our company that think that oh my god what am i then gonna do and so on and and the thing that we do we held conversations all the time within the company we have like i said four or three strategy days each year which means that all our people are sitting there and you know we are communicating and we are workshopping and so on so i think that um, within these two years we have kind of you know built the muscles then the thing is of course you know uh, towards the clients so how do we you know remember kind of this thing that we are not just selling this we are actually you know talking about the whole process and so on but um, i think the conversation model is the only thing you know that that i can think of and and of course you know we have built our capacities along these two years as well so that that and i think that we have um in that way we have really good culture because we have the Thai Stelopari culture. So it means that, you know, when, when a new person comes to our, our offices or, or to our company, then uh, he or she immediately has his, uh, his or her chicken buddy, as we say, <laughs> chicken buddy, so that, you know, you, ha you can have someone that you can ask stupid questions and so on and so on. And so the culture also, you know, uh, then goes on and, and the way we do things goes on and then we have the one thing actually which is important in, in, in change is that we don't have uh, fixed teams we have flexible teams which means that we we learn really fast because if one team you know uh, develops something then you know the four people go to uh, other teams so they learn and it's really really quick it's one of the things actually that I think that makes us very agile for change but we'll see. Maybe, you know, in two or three years, I'll come here and I said that the revenue, well, oh, God, didn't go so well. <laughs> Hopefully not. Thanks for the um, excellent presentation. <coughs> and I have a one question regarding the purpose thing that you mentioned and said that not that many Finnish companies yet are very good at, you know, um, outlining their their purpose. Uh, I have been personally struggling with defining the difference between this so fashionable purpose, and as we word it today, and the old-fashioned mission. So how would you define the difference between those two, is my question. Yeah. That's a very, very good question, because if we, if, if, you, if we look at it really strictly, there's no difference. If we look at it, you know, what does it mean, it, there's no difference. For me, I think, because I'm a communications person, words matter. And already the word mission is like, you know, it represents something old. It represents something uh, old company culture. It usually is like something that we are going to be number one in our market in this or that. And it's not a purpose that is that represents the whole community or something bigger. It's something that uh, is kind of, you know, com comparing you with the competitors. And I, I think that's the big difference be between purpose and mission. It doesn't mean, you know, you can have a mission that is like purpose. But I myself, I think that when you build something new, when you, when you do new things, it helps if you, if you have new words for it. It kind of, you know, um, maybe uh, stresses it more than just, you know, using the old words. And I know this is a topic that, you know, the uh, people in this industry are talking all about all, all the time about there's this ad agency guy who actually works in the same agency that my husband is working who always yeah why you know you use this purpose thing this is some communications people thing you know yeah you, why don't you why why don't you just use your mission and vision I, they are good words and we are having you know twitter conversation with him all the time about this but as i said i think i feel that the words are really important because they they kind of you know emphasize something but it's a good question because strictly yeah i'm 34 and i'm quite seriously want to open a company at 45 so i still have 10 years okay to <laughs> <laughs> what kind of advice would you give to me hmm. there are so many <laughs> Well, first of all, as I said in my presentation, if you build something new, build it in your own way. Don't, you know, don't build the company that the neighbor is building, build your own company. Even if it's, no, it's not traditional and people are saying you can't do this. 
because you know someday people can do that and you can be the first one and uh, then the second thing is maybe that um, uh, if you grow and when you grow as a company then you know start hiring help because many entrepreneurs I m me included I was like Friday night at uh, 8 o'clock I had my glass of wine though because you know then it felt more like not work even if it was and then I started paying bills and and you know at that point I shouldn't have uh, done that anymore but it's it's really hard because you know it, it's it's insecure I mean you don't know I mean you just think every time I employed I, I uh, hired a person I thought that okay if I don't pay for myself then we can manage and of course it went well but you know you you never know but I would s just suggest that be a little bit maybe braver than I was <laughs> thanks uh, three questions if I may uh, where are you here okay <laughs> great <laughs> could you talk a little bit uh, what kind of change programs or projects do you do currently for customers and is there some sort of a uh, customer segment that you like or that you focus on and then lastly that what kind of advice would you give for someone uh, to detect if a company or a culture <laughs> is open or if there are some assholes there? <laughs> <laughs> well, the first one is, is the hardest because uh, because they are not some uh, they are not like you know supermarket uh, project that you can buy and this is and this is this and this is that. But uh, right now, I think. One of the most exciting thing is that we have this Labra project, which is a laboratory. Uh, we have, I think, eight companies there uh, doing this uh, scenario, future scenario work and company culture work. And we call it like it's not just some kind of company culture, but what is the culture that uh, generates change? What is the culture that has open communication channels and so on? And they are doing that right now, and it's really exciting. It's also d exciting because they do it at, at our headquarters. So we, we have this uh, big lobby space like this, and people are coming through doors. And the and, and, uh, uh, manager said to us yesterday that uh, in, in Slack that, you know, remember to behave, uh, you know, kindly when you come, come to work. Or if you want to work at home, that's fine too. And and so, <coughs> but that scenario work is really exciting because it's something that you start with, you know, okay, what are the things that are open? And um, there are no industries that I, I you know, prefer, but, um, hmm. No, I, I think that actually one of the best things about this work is that you don't have, you know, just one industry to work with. Uh, that's a, a difference if you work with a client or you work in, in an agency. Uh, if you are a client, you have this one thing that, that you one brand that you are building and so on. But if you are in an agency, you have several. And if you're an impatient kind of person, you know, it's, it's nice to have many things. That's actually something that I think that uh, politics is also good at because politics is pretty much the whole human life uh, from birth to death kind of so it's 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 there are some similarities um, the last question was the open uh, communication culture mm. sorry yeah that's a good question because um, if you build like this kind of thing that people are uh, going to the manager and saying and uh, now you know she said something about her and that's that's not a good culture uh, so well my advice is to build strong conflict culture within the company and i mean that in a kind way not the way that you know make trouble all the time and every day but like if you have the culture where pe where people can be can be open and say things even if you are you know a uh, higher ranking person, then then you have a good culture. We did actually a survey like um, maybe two years ago. We asked from uh, Finnish uh, leaders and Finnish workers, employees, that uh, 
do they think that it's uh, okay or easy to challenge uh, the, the person who is your leader or manager or higher ranking and surprisingly surprisingly leaders said that yes it's really easy we are so so easy you know to challenge yeah, and so on and the employees said that it's really hard so that's that's an example of a culture gone wrong and and that's something that you can actually measure because you can measure before and then you can think oh, okay well how can we you know make this better but i'm not just ma i'm not just talking about the challenging between you know leaders and employees but also you know between employees so that you can say straight out what you think and what you mean instead of you know keeping it in your head and then it it come it becomes bigger and bigger and uh, then you know either one is going to turn into an asshole anyway Okay. Okay, so I'm here. Well, okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Yo, so you it's said really confusing, that you know, I just <laughs> hear the voice. And okay. Yeah, well, the, you said that words are important for you, and you're now branding yourself more with change from communications. So there's so many companies using this change word, mm. and change is there, change is mm. here, and we're just changing so fast and everything. So what does it mean, mean for you, and how you differ from others? Well, we are not changing in that way that we have this, I call it a communication religion. You know, we actually do, still do communication, but we do it in a different mindset and we want to bring it to the strategy core. Uh, we do that already. It's not something that we don't do and we just, you know, start doing tomorrow or next week or next month or something like that. It's something that is expected of us. It's more like, you know, building the capacity to be strong, stronger in that kind of business. And, and it means that we are the specialists that come with the power tool. That's what it means to me. Yes. Hey, um, hey. hey. <laughs> you know, I'm here. <laughs> Uh, thanks for a really inspiring uh, presentation. I have a question. I you mentioned that communication need to be embedded in every single like kind of stages, like from the purpose to the end part, um, and it needs to be really systematically embedded. Can you please like share some examples how you did differently, so that like how to do that, basically? How we as a company did? Yeah, that. yeah. So if anybody else want to do it okay. somehow in a similar way, how should we do it? Well, we started with communication. I mean, we started with communicating. We have done it since the beginning. I've always said to, my, to our people, because we invested in it a lot. We invest a lot of time in communications, in our own communications. We really invest a lot. And, and time and resources and everything. We publish tons of, you know, things and, and we have, you know, tons of blogs. I don't know, Nico is, you know, better aware of how many, but our head of publishing said like, you know, now we have 86 blogs or something like that. It's, it's like massive, I mean. I'm, I'm writing a blog and our head of publishing says, no, you know, Kirsten, not this week, not this week, we are full. So, so we are really, you know, doing that. We are really expressing our views and our, uh, you know, thinking about the future, about the, the communications industry, about uh, uh, what, it, what is changing, why it is changing in the world, and so on and so on. So, I mean, we don't do ads, we do communication. But it's something that you have to invest in. And I think that's, that's something that, you know, traditional companies don't do much. And... Um, not in the the you know communication outside, but not either you know in the in, in the inside, because you hear a lot of that talk. Actually, maybe no one is saying that in our company. You know, internal communication is really fantastic. I mean, you say that it's really bad, uh, and and you know that's 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 a thing that you can fix, but you don't do that, and that's uh, that's a. Uh, uh, clear mark that you know the communication is not in the core in that company 
And if you want, you know, people to know your strategy and know what they are doing, you have to communicate. But it, it takes a lot of resources and, and it's complicated, if you can say. It's not hard, but it's complicated. It needs different muscles than we have. It's, it's not like you send some emails. Okay, so in this, this um, I'm just going to let you know, I have this mental map when you raise your hand. I add you to my mental queue and then I'm going to come <laughs> at you when it's your turn. Okay. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I want to come back to your dream of a collective brain. <laughs> uh, that really Remember, I don't know anything about it. Yeah, but that, that <laughs> really resonated with me and I'm coming back to the things we talked. Uh, we all, like approach a lot uh, the way you kind of do the change for your clients. I'm personally doing uh, coaching on the personal development, which kind of strives for the individual change. So I kind of believe that we already work as a collective brain within a company, a com company is a collective brain. Yeah. But what is your take on the matter of how can you be sure that those neurons, which are your people or those people within mm. that collective brain of the company, really operate and communicate on the level you really want to communicate and the company wants to strive as a communicating brain? I mean, I want to go back to these traditional business seminars where people don't ask so <laughs> goddamn hard <laughs> questions. <laughs> ah, how can you be sure? I don't have an answer for that, but uh, one thing I know for sure is that the companies nowadays, they want to, you know, make sure of everything. They want to, you know, control everything. And I don't, I don't think that that's a good way to do it. I mean, I think that if you think about your own brain, I mean, um, I don't know about your brain though, my brain, <laughs> uh, it's like, you know, a hundred different things at the same time. And then I remember, oh yeah, I, I, I just forgot this and all this and that and Twitter and, you know, so and so. So I think that the company is like that as well. And, and at best it's a good thing, you know, because it's, it reaches to different, you know, things. It reaches further than you can do alone. You, you have those, you know, you, you also bring information from the place that you could not, you know, go to yourself. If you if you understand what I mean, but I'm thinking like you know if you could have the collective brain, I mean that would mean some some AI for sure, and I don't know anything about that, but it would be really really fun to experiment something like that. You know how how can you communicate so, so that you know you just you kind of you know have a place where you can. It's not an intra thing. It's something you know a lot lot more intelligent. And as I said, I don't know anything about it. It's just a dream and. I'm sure at some some point it's 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 a reality, and I don't mean like that. That you know that we have this thing thing in our head, and we can you know read in each other's minds. That's that's a different thing. When I was a kid, actually a, a child, I always you know I read this Akuanka Donald Duck, and and I always you know was afraid that when I sit in the bus, that this bubble you know comes <laughs> over my head and and tells people what I think. And I actually really had to some sometimes, you know, look that there is no bubble, <laughs> thank God. So I'm not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about that, but you know, how do we have all the information that the company has in one place so that we could have this collective brain? I don't know, but it's a dream. That's true. That's true. One thing I think that when you when we are talking about the values and some tha and, and the beliefs in the, in the company, I think one thing is good to remember that that as well is all always a conversation. It's not a statement, because if you have like you know, I don't know, kindness as a value, then it's it's not that some it's not something that we automatically just you know, do. It's something that, you know, sometimes we are an asshole and we have to be reminded that, you know, our value is kindness. Do you think that this is kind? And, and not in, in, in a bad way, but in a good way. And I think that if we're talking about, uh, is there, uh, do we choose our clients or something like that? Is there some client that we don't want to work with or something? That's also a value conversation. 
and it doesn't come from the words, it comes from the conversation. And it can also change, you know, the conversation can also change the values because we, we feel that A, we are not really doing that, can we keep it as a value if we are not try if we are not trying even to do it? Or then you know we can you know hey we we have to step back, we have to honor our values, but it's always a conversation, and that's the best way also you know for people to remember what the values are. Not that they are the four words, and and if you you know take the first letters, you get a, a nice word so that you can remember it was bold or something like that. So in that also I believe in communication. Okay. okay. Uh, <coughs> so you had that slide with two arrows. The <coughs> double disruption. The double disruption slide. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that was a really nice one. So, so um, uh, you have this value of kindness for example but in in the let's say in the globalized world, uh, to me it seems that um, the assholes are winning. <laughs> that uh, <laughs> that um, uh, you have some uh, smart, cynical people uh, who are uh, very good at communicating and using the modern tools of communication. Uh, let's say the. Uh, 2016 elections, Brexit elections. Mm. You have people who mm. interfere in, in like democratic processes. Uh, Cambridge Analytical. You have um, a sort of uh, machine learning uh, methods. So you basically, you can. Uh, uh, they they put a lot of power in the hands of um, these these um, smart people, uh, who can sort of bypass. Uh, um, processes. So, so, uh, um, and and um, uh, it seems that in in international politics, the the trend recently is that you get these kind of international strongmen in in many different countries, and um, they they seem to be there for for um, for some time. So, so. Um, is your uh, solution to that to put the, the tools of good communication into the hands of the non-assholes, or, <laughs> or wh what's what's the plan? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a master plan for the world, but uh, if I were John Tierney or, or Roy Baumeister, I would say that please read our book, the Bo the Power of Bad, which is a good book about this. Uh, first of all, in that sense that we have the negativity bias so that we uh, usually see the bad but, but we don't see the good. And I think that that's part of the problem. I'm, I agree with you that it looks bad. It really looks bad and, and, and the powers that are now pushing are not really good ones. They are not, not the ones that open the world but something else. But then there is a good example of great communication and big impact with it, which is the climate change and Greta Thunberg, a small uh, y a young, young uh, Swedish girl who has actually made the whole impact through communication. So I believe you know that there are the, bo the both powers are and I, 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 I don't believe that the assholes are winning even if it looks like that. And I think that the, the if, you, if you think about the communication revolution as we say it, you know, it brings the bad, but it also brings the good. It also, you know, generates movements like Me Too, which, you know, uh, there are age-old structures which, which systematically does something bad. And suddenly, you know, we get a movement, global movement around that, and, and so on. So I, I do actually believe in communication, even in this one. But we have the good ones, you know, have to be active. And that's a challenge because when you go to Twitter, you know, you just, oh, okay, uh, no, maybe not that. No, I'm not participating in that either. And so on. But, you know, it's something that you have to maybe do. Yes. Hello, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, this whole time I've been trying to come up with a translation for Astuattois and Tontila. If somebody comes <laughs> up with one, uh, please help me with this. Because my question is, uh, what was it? Step on one's property. Okay. And my question is about that, because 
I, being this kind of person, I am. I'm, I have to admit, I'm kind of afraid of conflict. And what my what my question is is that uh, when people have different strengths and specialities, when do you decide you have the place to uh, start a conflict, whether it's your part to do that or not? For example, when visuals work with copywriters and so on. Uh, when is your place to start a conflict and when should you, for a lack of better words, shut up, <laughs> per se? Um, the conflict thing is really hard because it's not something that you can design mechanically. It's, it's something that, you know, comes with the atmosphere or something like that. Uh, nowadays, uh, we are talking ab sci about psychological safety, which you should have the atmosphere of psychological safety. That's a bit problematic because, you know, it actually doesn't come in itself. Uh, psychological safety, I think, is built with conflicts. If you think about, like, um, a couple, you know, a m married couple, for instance, uh, a relationship, you actually build the trust uh, through the conflicts. Because then you can see, okay, this one I trust in this place, you know, and we had res this really bad fight, and then we still, you know, managed to get through it. We managed to do something constructive with it. So this is like Munakana <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Uh, so um, generally, I would say that the team should have that kind of atmosphere that the team leader is the one who you know has to be the one kind of uh, building the the safety nets or something like that but then you you can have these mechanical tools as well you know you can you can practice you know the conflict thing you can um, we can for instance say that we are a five person team and we decide that you know this week you are the one who has to conflict so that means that if you are timid and you know shy, you know that we are we expect that from you. It it becomes like an expectation and not something that you feel you know uncomfortable with. So there are kind of you know practice tools for that, but but the real stuff happens on the go. So so the team leader is one that is that is absolutely critical, and if the team leader is one that cannot take, you know the challenge, then it it doesn't work because you have to that sh she or he has to be the one who you know survives that the best who who is not taking it in itself and then of course you can you can build i mean in during coaching or something you can build those things I within yourself you know we have these defenses that you can learn your defenses so that you know that uh, you have this fight and flight for instance i have definitely the fight defense so if you challenge me, I could come, you know, that, yeah, I could. And that means that, you know, if we were a team, we would have to work together with that because you would have to know that I am like that. And then, you know, it doesn't mean anything. But if you are a shy person, I mean, if I do it once to you, then you're, <gasps> I cannot work with her. No, I don't think that it should ma um, it should uh, you know be done through anyone. I sh I think it should be done straight. But if you have a team, you know, like here, because I don't know I don't know if it's if if it's so constructive if you come from another team to another team and say you know that don't do this. If you are a copy from this team and and you go to the a art director to this team to say something, I don't think that that's a good conflict. You know, but the thing is that uh, it, it, I think it's very detrimental for a company if status is the thing that determines who is right. And that's the conflict practice that you have to have for that not to happen. Thank you for the, for the really, really good speech. And uh, the, the question is, you have been talking a lot about change. <laughs> and you have you have done That's a good. you have done a big change transferring from politics to be an entrepreneur. Mm. 
you told us today, this one I missed in the news, that you had diminishing your, your ownership from 91 to 51. And you don't uh, have any more kind of like any kind of a role in your company that you have been owning. Uh, I have a role, but it's a different. Yeah. Uh, that was my question. Yeah. Then. Okay. What, what is your role? How you keep your role uh, when um, it's, it's not at least how it seems to like outside at this point, you have no official role. Um, how you will handle that and how you feel about that change yourself because you most likely will still hang around in the office or <laughs> or will you be like one of those um, talking about thinking about one lawyer he cut to, to the pension I heard last summer and I heard from the office that he's sneaking in every once in a while <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not gonna be that one no no well, actually, I have a role uh, because uh, I'm still a member of the board. I'm the biggest owner still, so I have a role. And everyone knows that. And, and you know, because we are a company that we are, it's not like the roles are not mechanical either. And, and uh, Mika asks that, okay, so how do we then, you know, uh, work this thing that who does which and whatever. And, and we said with Taru that, you know, we had been, you know, in, in partnership for many, many years, and we don't have this specific role kind of play, and, and we don't think that we need it either. But the truth is that I'm going to be less uh, less there, and uh, I'm not doing any uh, client work. I'm mainly there to help the company itself to change, to grow, to be something that we want it to be in the future. But then, you know, I have a little bit time for something else as well and and I think that's that's exciting the change I mean one thing about the change is that y when you you know you have to drop something and then you get something and the pain for dropping something is first the thing that comes like my flu it's it's something that comes but then you know then there are something else that you gain but you don't you don't see it at that moment so that's why I think the change actually is hard and scary because you have to you know, let go of something, and it's scary. But um, I think that there are some adventures still in the future, and I have a, I have a few plans though. But this year I'm going to write. Yeah, this this year I'm going to write like I I promised to write two books, and that's a bit much even to me. And we are writing the the other one with Mika, and then I'm writing about purpose. Uh, that that comes then 2021 spring and and then i'm i can tell you now i haven't told anyone but uh, i'm actually writing book with the finnish writer hannu mäkelä and we are writing letters to each other and it's really fun and it's kind of like you know stretching your writing muscles or something like that and so writing at least and then i think i have a few plans maybe start another company or something but not now and not a competitor no <laughs> Thank you. It's a great um, event. Thanks to you. Thank you. Uh, about this double disruption slide again. Um, do you have uh, non-profit organizations among your clients that can help you to save the world? <laughs> 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 or you help them? <laughs> yes, those two. Uh, we, uh, we get, as I, I think many agencies get, a lot of requests for for the pro bono work and then we um then it happened actually a few years ago that i noticed that you know because we are growing fast uh, everyone has plenty of work to do so it kind of easily happens that you say no to the pro bono work because you know we have these clients and we have responsibility and all that and then i noticed that and then i just started thinking that okay we have to you know build some kind of mechanism to this because we want to do pro bono work and then we made this, I think it's now like 1% or something like that, that we use for the pro bono work. Or then it's like you have two uh, days for doing pro bono work. And yeah, last year is what it was all for the climate change uh, thing. But we do th do that and it's a very rewarding thing actually to do. But, but I think the main thing that we did a few years ago is that we uh, kind of decided what the topic is so that we are not doing this and that and that 
like last year we did the climate change so so you can a a as a company you can see the impact and and it feels good it feels better you know because you see that you have done this uh, instead of this li this little thing and this little thing and thi this little thing although you know uh, then there is the thing that it's good because we have diverse people so they have different interests so I, I'm not actually I don't know what they have decided for this year how it's going to be Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Kersi. It's been wonderful. I'd like to go back to the ownership structure a little bit because early on you made the decision. It sounds like a like a decision that uh, you would wa want to own the company alone. It's a strategic decision but also a very practical one. Why did you decide to own it yourself until up until now? Uh, how did you manage the risks that come with that, the cash flow and, and the risks? And how were you able to uh, attract talent and hold on to talent? Many other entrepreneurs choose differently. Why did you make this choice and why did you change your mind? <laughs> well, the, um, I think the original choice was kind of an accident, really. I mean, I had a friend that and we were, you know, uh, many years talking about, you know, that whether or not we are building a company together. And then when I was ready to do that, she was doing her Vaitaskirja thing. So no time for the, for the company. And then I said, oh, shit, I, I'm not going to wait because now it feels good. And then I, you know, b started the company by myself. So uh, it was kind of an accident. And, and then, you know, I didn't even think that anyone would like to own it with me to be true, truthful, really. I just thought that, you know, it's a risky business, really. <laughs> and, and so I felt more comfortable that the risk is mine and, and not someone else's. It's, it's, you know, hard enough when, uh, when your employee, who is a young person and, and recently, you know, uh, got out of school and, and works for you and says that, well, I'm going to buy an apartment. I'm getting a loan for that. And you think, oh my God, Lisa's, uh, you know, apartment loan. You know, how can she pay it if we don't ma make it and so on. So I kind of, you know, thought that it's it's more comfortable if I have the risk by myself, in, m in myself, in my own hands, so to speak. And then uh, the first, actually, uh, point where I was thinking about even something like that. I, I, I honestly, I, I didn't even think that anyone would like to own it. And then, of course, you know, the problem c becomes that the company is ha is having some kind of value, so it costs a lot to buy it. And then the w first point really was when Taro came as a CEO, and not even in the beginning because she didn't, you know, make any kind of that kind of request. But Taro is like, you know, I mean, you cannot have a better CEO. I mean, she is like the best. I'm really, really happy that she's with us and, and like within a year I knew that I really want to be partners with her if, if she is willing. And then the problem of course was the uh, price and so on, but then Taro bought 10%. And then, you know, I think it, it's like this change kind of thing and if you think that you want, if I think that I want to do something else in the future as well, then I'm not going to hang on to, you know, this one. And then uh, we are uh, now preparing programs so that 20% of the company can be owned by our employees. Uh, so we are making kind of big changes simultaneously. And then Mika is buying 9% and Taru is, is, is then having 20%. So I don't know, it's, it's kind of, you know, it, it goes as we, it's, it, we make the decisions or I make them as we go and as I see fit. And, and I kind of think, you know, also that um, I've done this like, what, 12 years. So I think it's time, you know, to let go of something and then, you know, make room for something else. And, and if I'm not going to be 100% in it, so then I don't deserve to own it either, 100%. But I do manage. I did manage to, you know, hang on to the fifty-one. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
but that can change in the future as well. Okay, so we have reached officially the end of this queue. Um, are there any more questions? No. At least one. <laughs> Thank you. This has been really a very interesting evening. Um, one question: uh, How do you f how, how how do you found the right chicken for your company? <laughs> and and have you made any false recruitments? Kind of any mistakes? Because it's a big risk and it's it can be very expensive for the companies. Well, the first thing uh, that was really important was that. Um, I didn't hire communications people, actually. I hired very diverse kind of people who didn't have the communications, kind of traditional communications experience. And I think that's the key thing. Uh, then at some point, when we grew really fast and we needed like these, you know, experienced communications people as well, then I started, you know, to look <laughs> for for the uh, people from our competitors, of course. And then I started to recruit them, and we have wonderful those people as well. But at first I noticed that if you get the experienced one, uh, he or she tries to, you know, mold the company into the traditional communications company and the processes and the methods and so on. So it was important that, that we didn't recruit there. Then when we grew fast, then, you know, I, s I started thinking that we do need the communications people. And I started to hire that in, in that direction. And then at some point I noticed that I'm doing this wrong. I'm doing this wrong. Now I'm building a traditional communications company. And then, you know, because it's harder to find the people who are not already in the, in the industry, in the business. So, um, but I think that that's, that's one of the keys that we have very diverse people and we have been able to build co a completely new way of doing doing communications and doing change. Uh, yes, we have made also false recruiting uh, uh, decisions and uh, uh, one, of, one of those <laughs> was this um, data scientist that we, we thought that, okay, data science, uh, the technology, we need that, we need that. And then we hired this really, really good data scientist and within, you know, less than a year, he wanted to go <laughs> go away from us because we didn't know what to do with him. So uh, that was a false <laughs> recruit, uh, a recruitment uh, decision for sure. Uh, the bad thing is that, you know, it wasn't good for him either. So we did a dis disservice to him because we, we thought we, you know, could do something else with him. And we, we thought that we were more ready than we were in that direction. He's a good guy and he likes us still and, and we parted in very, you know, nice, uh, nice uh, terms, but anyway. Uh, then there are, yes, there are some people, you know, that um, come to our, our company and, and say that they love change and they thrive, you know, when, when things are not in order and, and they uh, love to manage themselves and so on and so on. And then they come to our company and they notice that, well, I don't love it, it this much. <laughs> so we call our uh, organization like this semi-anarchist uh, company or, or structure and that we have. And not everyone like it. And, and then, you know, then you can maybe work with us. And then, yes, there has been a couple of assholes <laughs> as well, which has been really hard. And, and um, I remember Mika a few years ago gave me an advice and said that Kirsi, it's, uh, it's not good to learn to walk uh, um, a, s a stone in your shoe. You, you need to take it away. And it's a good advice, but it's really hard because, you know, people don't become assholes by themselves. They become assholes because you don't do something right as an as an. Uh, as an uh, employer as well so so it's 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 you know mutually really not a pleasant place to be and then yeah we have had those as well that have you know thought that they do need a career path that is steeper or they need actually they liked it that we didn't have the 
titles, but then they, you know, need them anyway, and then they have gone away. And, and then within these two years, we have been having some turbulence as well, because when you change from something to something, then, you know, you also need to restructure and something like that. And then, you know, some people, and I understand it very well, think that th they are not, you know, getting what they were promised or they lost something within the restructuring or something like that. And that's also hard because they are really good and capable people, but sometimes, you know, it just happens. So it's not, it's not easy. Recruiting is really hard, I think, because uh, the whole process is kind of, you know, it's not real. It's something, you know, you, 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 you have the conversation, which is not really an honest conversation. It's, it's like fake. It's like kind of theater or something like that, but. Back to, back to your DD. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I found it really interesting the way that you had like a, a mega trend, a climate change. It could be anything to make purpose for per people. And then I was looking at the kind of companies that you saw as potential competitors or McKinsey's and, and so forth. Uh, and then you had the human resources, and you were talking about the fact that there is like you're missing or, or losing people uh, at early age and, and so forth. This is a very interesting issue, and I see very few change agencies working on that. Usually it's internal HR or whatever working with it. So could you uh, elaborate that a little bit more? It, 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 this is interesting, and this could be something that would, could be your, your competitive edge. I think so too. Um, when we have been working with the company culture, we of course, you know, bump into things. And uh, uh, the one thing we have noticed is, as I said, that it's it's not a company problem. It can be a company problem, but it usually isn't, because and it's it's not an industry problem. Uh, it's not an agency problem or something like that. Uh, it's a common problem, and and I think that one of the um, most detrimental things is that the companies are kind of, you know, hiding it. Because it's a shameful thing that we have people who are burned out, so we are hiding it. And that, that needs the collective brain so that we can solve it. And, and that's why we, are, we have been working, you know, with the, uh, with the, within the company culture, within the people, wi with the people, so that what can we do, what can we learn, and, and it's like, it's, it's at this moment, it's kind of a experiment, if, I, if I'm honest. But it's something that definitely will impact the companies. It will definitely impact who they are, you know, um, who are coming to work for them. Uh, are they uh, attractive to some people or not? Uh, how are they, w you know, dealing with the uh, well-being? Of, of people. We just saw in the news the uh, Smartum company who gave three days for, for doing exercise and so on. And, and I think that this is something that is a uh, very big trend, not just the exercise but y or culture even, but you know, uh, this sort of rhythm within the work. And we are having, it's, uh, it's a bit funny, and, and I think that, oh, I know that our people do not take it seriously, even if I do, but we have, uh, in our company, we have this Lasakoski concept. And I know it sounds funny. Lasakoski is also a place in, in Savo. Uh, and I have a, my summer cottage is there. I've been there from uh, the early age of zero. Uh, and and uh, we have this theory, or I have this theory that it's not enough that we have this four weeks of vacation or two weeks of vacation and then we, you know, do the, the work is really, really rhythmically hectic. But we need, and also the world entirely, I mean, it's not, it's not just work. I think that we are going to see companies who are saying actually that you cannot be in your social medi media accounts during your work day because, you know, you have to keep your brain like, you know, uh, in a, in a calm place or in a calmer place. But I think that uh, the thing is that we have to introduce various rhythms during our work day. And I, th I personally think that the nature impact is really big. 
and I think that's something that you know we as as Finland and Finnish companies we could you know like really make th this a big phenomena and uh, the Lasakoski thing is like uh, a room where there is a very very calm nature film and you can go there and you know just you know drop your drop your work from your your head for a, for a little bit and you know just you know let the stress go a bit bit down and we are having this experiment now that um, we're just starting that we take like five to ten people and and then we experiment a bit you know that what if you go to Lasakoski like three times a day like ten minutes per time does it you know have an impact and we are measuring it also I don't know yet in in which way, but there are several options. Or if it's uh, you know helpful if you go to Lasakoski just before you go home from work. I noticed when I was uh, uh, when I was younger, uh, my daughter was in the kindergarten, and I I was then in in uh, in the parliament working in the parliament, and I I remember that the five o'clock rule. You know, if you have kids, that you have to be there before five o'clock. And if you are, you know, five over five, it's it's not a good thing. And then I was always, you know, rushing to to work to get my daughter so that I can be there at five o'clock. And I was really stressed. And I noticed that every time when we walked home, we had a fight. Every time. And then I thought, that, God damn it! And why is she so, you know, bad tempered? And and you know, <laughs> I've had a shitty day. And <laughs> do, does she really have to shout at me? Then I noticed, hmm, maybe it's my attitude actually. And I started to, when I was in the bus coming towards the kindergarten, I started already, you know, like not really meditating. Lasakoski is not meditating, it's not mantras. It's just, you know, th the general thing what you do when you go to your summer cottage, you sit, you know, by the lake and you just, <sighs> it's like that. And I was in the bus and I was doing, <sighs> and then I went to, you know, pick my daughter up. No fight at, at all no fights at all. So that's what the Lasakoski thing is, is supposed to be doing to, to our brain and our you know, bodies and our stress level so that, that we could you know, vary our rhythm, not only work, work hard, play hard, as we said, but the Elonkanat motto is, but really have the various rhythms during the workday. I don't know, maybe it's, it turns out to be a discovery or something. <laughs> Okay, so after the next question, we have still time for one more. One more question, and the fastest hand will win. <laughs> Hi, uh, thanks for the sharing. I will first give a comment, and I will move on to the question. Or maybe you have partly, partially answered my question, actually. Uh, first of all, um, from the sharing, I think it's really inspiring as a young communication specialist um, to see how leadership has changed in the business world. I'm not talking politics right now, just <laughs> business world. And um, because I think changes is much needed for the leadership, like so that it impacts the whole company, uh, motivation, everything. And I find it inspiring. And it would be nice that like to see people start experimenting and change, like tiny things inside the company. And then now I'm going to ask, uh, it's kind of like counter theme question for the whole night. Um, how do you ground yourself personally among all these changes? Because changes are never easy and it can be really disturbing. It can be inspiring, intriguing and appealing and motivating, but it can be super disturbing as well. And even for, for yourself personally and also professionally, like in the company, because you are throwing your employees basically like when they first step in and it's kind of like a cultural shock wave for them like to adopt to a new mode as well. So how do you ground them? So yeah, two questions. Personally, badly, badly. I think I ground myself badly. I, um, I'm a very impatient person. So that means that I love change too much. I have like 10 different ideas. Sometimes I have to, you know, deny myself of reading business books altogether because I cannot read them because, you know, I can, oh, this we have to do. Oh my God, why haven't we done this already? And, you know, uh, our employees and Taru does not like that. Then I go and, you know, you're a little bit too fast, you know, not yet. 
So I do it badly. Um, the, the way I ground myself is actually reading, uh, not the business books, but, but fiction and, and generally reading. I think that that's something like meditation for me. It's, um, I think that when I'm really, you know, like agitated and, and I seem to have no focus ability at all, then I especially, you know, then I need to read because it kind of, you know, you have to focus on one thing because otherwise you do, you are not you know getting the story, and the, and the voice uh, books the audio books are not good for that because they just you know it just goes from one ear to the other and you can think a lot of things during that. So I I read fiction. That's one way to you know get the rhythm right. Um, professionally uh, in our company, I think that we could do it better. Uh, we have um, recruited a lot of um, HR people and, and so on. So we have extra muscles for, you know, helping people to build their own. We, we call it chicken map, kanakarta, so that uh, what, what are they, their own uh, aspirations and how can we be a platform for that. But um, I think the culture is pretty much something that if you're really, really change averse, you maybe cannot work for us. I don't know, Nico can say no, yeah. <laughs> so maybe we could be better because, you know, it's, it's not good I for the diversity angle. It's not good that you have just, you know, these task rabbits who are really, really fast and, and, and doing change and this and that and, and that. But yeah, that's maybe the the thing that we are not very good at. How do you ground yourself? Yeah. <laughs> and okay. everyone is meditating, of course. <laughs> okay, is there any more questions? Well, I can't at least see any, see any. So in that case, thank you all for your questions. And thank before you. anything else, thank you, Kirsi, for visiting us. Thank you. Uh, can you get a round of applause? Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>